All right. This evening, uh, the title uh, for our uh, meditation is called Foundations First. That's what I have given it. We are in the fairly, we just, uh, uh, you know, spent about uh, how many? Four days? Yeah, this is the fifth day of the new year. God willing, if we uh, stay alive till the end of the year, that is quite a bit of a uh, number of days and hours that God has been, or God is entrusting to us. Therefore, it is important that we get our foundations right as we begin the new year. Yeah, I, I forgot who it is, but uh, this uh, beautiful um, statement is made by this person. Many people build castles in the air, but only a few lay foundations down in the ground. Many are building castles in the air, but only a few lay deep foundations in the ground. So as we begin this new year, what should be the foundation for our life? Is it something that the world offers? Is it something that uh, we are accustomed to doing year after year? Or is there a biblical foundation that we ought to lay and lay it well as we begin this new year? For that, uh, I'm going to take you to probably um, a verse, a passage in the Holy Bible that you may not expect to find foundations, but I think you will and I will find foundations that will help us lay deep roots as we begin this year. If you have your Holy Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 6. Otherwise, also the scripture verses uh, flashed on the screen. You can look at it. Now, the book of uh, the letter uh, written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church or the churches that he never met in the royal city of Rome was intended with a specific purpose. The purpose was not to correct any aberrant theology unlike he did in other churches like Corinthians, Galatians. However, the intention in writing the epistle, the letter to the churches at Rome, which he never visited, was to teach them the great and unchanging truths of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God in his great providence did not allow the apostle to visit the place, although in the first chapter he mentions that he has tried it several times. Because of this marvelous providence, this letter has been penned by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Hence, you and I, in God's marvelous providence, in a mysterious way, have been handed down this inspired scripture, which is the longest, I think, letter written and preserved from that century till now. And in these uh, you know, uh, uh, chapters of the letter written to uh, the churches at Rome, you and I are given the beautiful, foundational, everlasting, unchanging truths of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people can be Christians and be born again people for a long time and never really excavate the great and deep truths that are revealed in this specific letter. Hence, my prayer in the next uh, you know, half an hour to 40 minutes that we have is that we will expound the scripture, these six verses, and we will understand what are God's foundations for the life of a believer. These are not foundations that will help us just set some, you know, uh, you know, cornerstones so that we will reap some temporal benefits or we will reap some benefits in time. But these are foundations that will lay deep foundations for our life and also for our eternity. So I, by assumption, I'm believing that there are two kinds of people here in this uh, room this evening. One, probably those who, those of you who heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who have repented of your sins, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only savior and probably are living under his lordship, which means submission to the word of God. But probably there are also others who heard the gospel or who have never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore you have never repented of your sins, never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your only savior. And therefore you are not living living under the Lordship of Christ, namely under the authority of your word. Whoever you are this evening, the call is to look at these six verses and see if these truths are applicable for life and eternity. And if they are, then your call is to come and repent and live in submission to this word. Now, back in the day when they wrote the letters, it is essential for them to bear the name of the writer in the first place. Unlike how we write letters today, where the signing off of the 
uh, sender comes at the end, which is if I am writing an email or a letter, my name generally is signed off at the end, thanking you, yours faithfully or lovingly, still in Amaya. But unlike us, those days, people, when they open the scrolls, they needed to know the author because you can't really open the scroll completely and check the name at the end. So Paul, to authenticate his authorship and like other epistle writers do, has mentioned his name first. And then we will read these six verses and probably I'll place before you four truths that are foundational for our life. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. In this section, Paul is writing to the churches whom he had never personally met, but probably during the time of uh, the great uh, uh, you know, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, when the apostles rose up and preached the gospel, when the first uh, preacher, Apostle Peter, preached the gospel, many people came to know the Lord. Probably at that time, people from this region too became believers and maybe they went back and the church at Rome began to function. So in order to teach them and give them apostolic instruction about the great gospel, unchanging gospel truths, Paul is writing it. And here in this epistle, uh, in the first six verses, he begins with these greetings. Let us look at a few four foundational truths that, that we must have in our lives as we begin this new year. Let's observe this first word, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Look at the even as he begins to write the letter, the purpose for which the letter is being written is explicitly stated. This entire letter is an exposition or an explanation of what the gospel of God is. Therefore, the first thing that I want us to know is the subject of the Holy Bible is the gospel of God. Now, we all believers believe that the Holy Bible is the exclusive, complete final, sufficient revelation of God. Once again, I will repeat, we all believers believe, ought to believe, that the Holy Bible is the exclusive, complete, final, and sufficient revelation of God, which means there's nothing more the Lord will add to his completed revelation. There's nothing less that has been given to us in the Holy Bible that we ought to uh, somehow scratch our heads and fast and pray to seek from God. All that we ought to know about life and eternity for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has already been given to us in the Holy Scriptures. But the question is, what is the subject of the Holy Bible? Or what is the focus? What is the summary of the Holy Bible? The Holy Bible's subject and summary in one statement is the gospel of God, the gospel of God. We will look at the word gospel of God in a brief moment from now. But let us understand this. The man who is writing Paul, which is his Greek name for the Hebrew name Saul, has been a terrible person before he began to pen this letter. Who was he? According to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, according to his own confession, he was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of the church. He was an insolent man. He was an opponent of the gospel and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, he was also, according to his own confession, a foremost of sinners, chiefest of sinners he called himself. And in Galatians 1.13, he said he tried to destroy. In fact, I think in the same verse, he says very violently, he tried to destroy the church of God. But this man who is a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent of the gospel and the church of God, a chiefest of sinners who tried to violently destroy the church of God. Now, now by his own confession, has become a servant of Christ Jesus. Now, uh, the word servant um, for cultural sensitivity reasons has been translated as servant. But the actual word in Greek, doulos, means bond slave. During those days, slavery was a legal thing. Now, in the New Testament times, 
slavery was always involuntary which means no slave would go and offer himself but he was he was, he remained a slave it was not a willful thing however in the new testament every time doulos was used the expression always mentioned that it was a willing joyful submission so paul is saying from an insolent opponent from a violent destroyer and a persecutor and a blasphemer of the church of god from being a chiefest sinner now he has become the doulos the willing bond slave of christ jesus by saying that he's saying that is my identity now second thing he called himself an apostle he was called to be an apostle now you must understand this word apollo apostle simply means a man who is sent out like an ambassador who would go for the emperor of rome to proclaim the good news that comes from the emperor he calls himself a persecutor once a violent destroyer of the church once now has become the herald the proclaimer the sent out one the ambassador of the gospel third thing so that becomes his credential he from being a chief sinner to a servant of the lord jesus christ from being a persecutor and being an opponent insolent opponent now being a proposer proponent and an apostle of the lord jesus christ from being a man who was bent on destroying the church of the lord jesus christ and the gospel he is now calling himself somebody who is set apart for the gospel of god he says that is the purpose of my life what is the what has happened from being a insolent opponent from being a chief sinner from being a violent blasphemer and uh, a persecutor of the church to becoming a man who found his identity in being a voluntary slave to the lord jesus christ from finding his great credentials in being an apostle of the lord jesus christ from making or setting himself apart for the gospel of god as the chief purpose of his life what has brought about this great great transformation the gospel of god the gospel of god my dear friends this evening that is the i want i want us to know that that is the power of the gospel that is the power of the gospel i want to invite you at the beginning of this year to understand this if you are a believer and you want to know what god who is the only great creator and the owner of all things who has destined eternity for his own glory if you want to know why he created you why he brought you into this world what is his purpose for your life this year and for the rest of your life and eternity then this is what he wants you to know from his book the holy bible that is the message of the holy bible is the gospel of god it has the power to transform a violent insolent opponent a persecutor a blasphemer a hater of god to a person who a person who joyfully willfully submitted himself to serve the lord jesus christ who, who has been called to be set apart for the gospel of god that is the transforming power of the gospel of god that is the subject of the holy bible this year i'm sure you will read the holy bible you will read it for various purposes you'll want to find out if god wants you to marry a specific girl or a boy you will want to read the holy bible to know if god wants you to join a particular uh, a course or or you want to know if god will give you a breakthrough in a particular company or so many other reasons but let me let me ask you to come back from all those base ideas that you have about the holy bible and to know that the subject of the holy bible is the gospel of god is the gospel of god the gospel that has the power to transform anybody into a person who god wants that person to become second thing paul a servant of christ jesus called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of god why is this the subject of the bible why is it the subject and the summary of the holy bible because the source of this message is god himself that's why the word that is used the uh, is is, is, is the, uh, the gospel that belongs to god the gospel of god gospel means good news evangelion means good news you know uh, in rome where the ambassadors the apostles or the ones who are sent by the emperor when they would go to read out some information that the citizens of rome had to know they would begin by saying the gospel they would begin by proclaiming good news this is the good news from the emperor but paul here says this is not a good news from an emperor who will be who is just born and live for some time rule and die this is from the emperor of all created things the invisible immortal god who created all things this is the 
gospel, the good news of this eternal, everlasting, uncontested, unrivaled king, the gospel of God. This is the good news of God. The reason it is good news is because this is the only news that the world has to receive to be delivered from the greatest, greatest threat that the world has, which is the holy, righteous, just, eternal wrath of God that is coming over a rebellious, God-hating, hell-deserving, sin-loving human race. That is why this is the subject of the Holy Bible, because the source of this gospel, good news, is God himself. Now, when we say gospel of God, it certainly means God is the originator of this gospel. This news has originated from God. He is the owner of this gospel. That is why you and I must be clear in knowing whose gospel we are listening to. And we will see how to know whose gospel we are listening to. Not only the gospel of God means he is the source, he is the owner, but he is the ultimate giver of this good news. This is the good news of God. Now, why is it good news? It is good news because in the gospel, God is announcing the rescue program for the sinner from God's own eternal wrath. God, in his sovereign mercy and grace, has brought about his son to be the eternal rescue person uh, and by placing the sins of the world on his son to rescue those people who repent of their sins. That is why it is good news. It is good news because God not only rescues the sinner from his just and holy and righteous wrath, but God also forgives the sinner. We who are enemies of God, godless, as the as Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 10 calls us, we are enemies, we are weak, we are godless, we are wicked, we are not righteous, we are not good. To such people, God extends his heart of forgiveness. But not only that, in this, this good news, because God not only forgives the sinner, not only rescues the sinner from his wrath, not only forgives the sinner, but God also justifies the sinner. God also sanctifies the sinner. That is why it is the greatest good news from the only great God. And he assures and grants eternal life to the sinner. All of this is possible because of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the good news that this insolent persecutor, this blasphemer who is chiefest of sinners has been transformed by this gospel to proclaim this gospel because this is the gospel of God himself. Now, brothers and sisters, I do not know what foundations you have laid for your life. But if the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the foundation of your life, every moment, every day, every, through, every, through all the thick and thin of life, through all the highs and lows of life, you will always be wavering. You will always be tottering because your foundation is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the whole message of the Bible. This, the source of this message, which is good news, is God himself. And that is why just look at these statements that I put down for us here. Gospel is the only most important good news for all of humanity, for all generations. Gospel is the only most important good news for all of humanity of all generations. Let us say, if I were to go through a really terrible time this year, if you were to go through a loss of something that is very dear to your heart, but if you are a person whose foundation has been laid by the gospel of God, then you need not worry in trusting the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the favor of God, the kindness of God, simply because God's good Goodness and love towards you is not determined by what he gives to you and does not give to you in time, but what he has given to you in history, in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the most, only most important good news for all of humanity of all generations. The gospel of God defines life and it determines every person's eternity. A very crucial statement to think about. It defines my life here but it determines my eternity and everybody's eternity. 
This is the greatest good news from the only great God. That is why it is great news. That is why it is the only good news because it is coming from the only uncontested creator and monarch of all of creation and all for all of eternity. This is the only answer to every question. You look at the world with so many problems. So many problems. There's confusion about so many things. There is a loss of all moral objectivity. We're increasingly becoming relativistic. We are losing all the absolutes. The only answer is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the only solution for every problem. The only hope to every person who is going to be doomed to death in the gospel of God. God has given himself to us. Therefore, to reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is to reject God himself. In nutshell, it is either the gospel of God or nothing. There is no in-between choice that people have before they die to determine where they want to spend their eternity. So the foundation for this year, let it be that you take the Holy Bible to read it, to understand that the emphasis, the ultimate summary of the Holy Bible is the gospel of God, which can transform any person, any person, the weakest, the vilest, the most wicked person into the child of God, into the proclaimer, the one who becomes the gospel of God and the one who proclaims the gospel of God. And who is the source of it? God himself. But let's continue reading in the source. Where do we get this from God? But how do we know we're getting it from God? The scripture says the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Number one, I want you to understand that the gospel is the promise of God. In the 16th chapter, he says the gospel is also the command of God, the command of the eternal God. That is why it must be preached to all people. But it is also the promise Promise that God will send a deliverer to rescue man from his own wrath. I think as the late theologian R.C. Sproul said, the, in the gospel, God rescues us from God. We have been rescued. And the promise is made in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And that happened when the Lord Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. And not only is it a promise, but it is a promise that has been given beforehand. Obviously, when Paul is writing the letter to the churches at Rome, uh, New Testament was not canonized, which means New Testament was not put together as a recognized, authoritative, validated, holy books of the Bible. So he's referring to the Old Testament, which means to say that the later part that he said that all of the scripture, where did God promise beforehand through his prophets, which means in one shot, the Holy Bible of or the entire Holy Bible of the Old Testament and now the New Testament are the only source for the gospel of God. And that is why he says it is in the Holy Scriptures. There is no other source for the gospel of God. The singular message of the Holy Bible is the gospel of God. Now listen to this. When you go to Luke chapter 24, when the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected and when, the, when his disciples, Cleopas and one more person whose name is not mentioned, were disappointed. And as they were discussing about the, the, uh, uh, the entire crucifixion saga, as they were discussing about how the women went in the morning and surprised the disciples talking about the empty tomb, when they were discussing the Lord himself appeared to them. But their eyes were kept from knowing him. And when the Lord began to rebuke them, he began to expound, the, expound to them the entire Old Testament. And then he said, isn't this is what written in the prophets, the Moses, Moses prophets, law and the Psalms? And from beginning with Moses, he explained to them, what did he explain? About his own suffering and then entering his glory. In a nutshell, the Holy Bible's summary is the gospel of God. That is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ told them. Which means there is only one place you can find with utmost clarity this singular message, the gospel of God, that is in the Holy Scriptures. Now, why is it important? Why is it important to repeat these statements so many times? 
Many of us today read the Holy Bible and miss the main point yet find so many things. The Holy Bible is not a book given to us to find some solutions from, for some existential problems. It will do that, but that is not the objective of the Holy Bible. The objective of the Holy Bible is to point to us the singular message of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God himself. So the question, dear brothers and sisters, is this. Are you living in this foundational truth? Have you lived the, your year like that last year? How about this year? Would you make this change? Would you build your life by reading the Holy Bible on this foundational truth that the entire message of the Holy Bible is the gospel of God? And the source of the, Holy, of the gospel of God is God himself. And where do you find the attestation for that? Only in the Holy Bible. Question every preacher when you listen to if he's not preaching from the Holy Bible and if the message is not in alignment with the gospel of God. And when you read the Holy Bible too, see what the gospel of God is mentioning there. If not, if not, you will be twisted by the enemy of your soul, Satan. Just like he twisted the scripture in, garden of, in the Garden of Eden. Just like he twisted the scripture to the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was fasting and praying. He twisted the scripture. He will twist it to you and to me too. And you will be led astray by many false preachers and teachers because you are never accustomed to reading the Holy Bible and understand that the subject of the Holy Bible, the source of the Holy Bible, is basically God himself proclaiming the gospel. Now the question is this, what is this gospel all about? What is the subject of the gospel? We understood the summary of the gospel. The summary of the Holy Bible is gospel. But what is it containing? What does it pertain? What does it contain and what does it pertain? Here is the answer. Paul, a servant of Lord Jesus Christ, an apostle called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through his holy prophet, through his prophets in the holy scriptures. What is that he promised? The gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? Here is the answer concerning his son. In other words, if you want to know what is the grand theme of the gospel, in one word, what is the subject of the gospel? What is the summary? What is the focal point of the gospel? The answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. It is about a person, a person who is God himself. And it is about God's son. This is the God, good news of God and good news of God proclaiming about his son. That is the gospel. And what does God want us to know from Genesis to Revelation? He wants us to know his son. Because in his son, God reveals himself to us. I was listening to L.T. J. Chandran uncle quite a few months ago. In John chapter 14, one of the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, we do not know. I think Thomas, right? We do not know where you're going. How can we go? How can we follow you? The Lord Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Now, the explanation that he gave is, L.T. J. Chandran uncle, that to know God can only be possible through the person God has sent. So Jesus is the revelation of God. It is through Jesus that you know God. You cannot know God outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot know Jesus Christ outside of the Holy Bible. Beware, dear brothers and sisters, when you read the Holy Bible, when you listen to a sermon, when you meditate, who is the source? Is it God or is it some false teacher, preacher or Satan himself? When you read the Holy Bible, your focus is on knowing the gospel or is it just at a what you call a therapeutic level of what do I get out of it right now? The gospel, the subject of the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ concerning his son. What concerning his son? Concerning his son that he was a... <coughs> sorry, sorry. Concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ is the heart of the gospel. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ is the gospel of God. But concerning his son, what is it that God wants us to know? He wants us to know that the Lord Jesus Christ was descended or was a descendant of David according to the flesh. 
Four things it tells us. Number one, it tells us Paul is trying to educate his readers that the gospel of God is about the Lord Jesus Christ, but the gospel of God about the Lord Jesus Christ, primarily about his historical reality. He descended from David according to the flesh. It happened in time, space, and history. Probably the apostle Paul was also born at the same time the Lord Jesus Christ was born. So he's trying to tell them that this was a historical reality. It happened in time, space, and history. This is very essential because by the time the apostles were writing their letters, educating and empowering the church with apostolic teaching and instruction, false teachers have already come beginning to say that Jesus Christ was a phantom, which means he was just a spirit being who appeared in human form occasionally. That is why the apostle John had to sharply rebuke as he wrote to the churches in probably in the areas of Mediterranean region and one John particularly to say that anybody who denies that Jesus Christ did not come in flesh is a belong is an antichrist. That's what Paul is affirming. It's a historical reality. He descended from the lineage of David according to the flesh. And it is a royal reality. He's linking his lineage directly to the nation that existed at that time, preserved by God's grace, the nation of Israel. And he's, uh, and he's uh, uh, claiming status to kingship by saying he came legally from the lineage of David. Thirdly, according to the flesh, he was really born in the flesh, just like you and I have body, he was a real historical person, not some spirit being. Finally, this was also a supernatural reality because he was born sinless through the virgin birth. In a nutshell, if you read the Holy Bible, Old Testament to New Testament, the summary of all of this, in Old Testament, it was a time of preparation and anticipation for the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. In New Testament, it is total accomplishment of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the explanation of who he is and what he has done and why people's eternity hangs on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in both the cases of Old and New Testament, the person that the Holy Bible points to is the Lord Jesus Christ. Primarily that he became a man. So the number one thing God wants us to know about the gospel is that gospel is about Jesus Christ and the gospel is about the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, once he, you know, he was descended from David according to the flesh, but he was also declared to be the son of God. You know, the word declared in Greek um, also is actually a word that, that sounds like horizon. Horizon is what, you know, differentiates, let's say, the earth from the sky. That's the marking of that, that marks or, or, or basically that demarks and sets a boundary between earth and sky. In a similar fashion, Jesus Christ, though a human being, born as a human being, though it is a historical reality, Though he was born as a physical person from the lineage of the royal line, though it is a supernatural work of God, one thing is true that he was declared, which means he is marked off as the son of God. He was eternally the son of God, but in his incarnation, which was anticipated in the Old Testament, in his incarnation, he was declared he was marked off, set apart from all people in humanity. He alone is marked off. Horizon was, uh, was set apart. He was, he was, he's, he's put in a different category altogether because of his resurrection as declared to be the son of God in power, in power, according to the spirit of holiness. It is the Holy Spirit who is who was the solo instrument. Uh, inst he, he, it is he who orchestrated because the Lord Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and gave himself to the hands of the Holy Spirit from his birth to his resurrection. It is the Spirit of God who was working in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, he was declared, set apart and declared to all humanity that he is the son of God by this unique work, which is rising from the dead. That's why it says he was declared to be the son of God in power. 
And where is the power demonstrated? Uh, who, who demonstrated the power? The Holy Spirit God. How? By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This speaks about the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just quickly brush up what we learned so far. The, su the summary of the Holy Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The source of the gospel is God, whatever he gave it to us in his word. What is the subject of this gospel? The Lord Jesus Christ. His humanity, which is a historical, physical, supernatural reality, but also his divinity, which was proven by his demonstrated power in the resurrection from the dead. This is concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why he is the forgiver of sins. He is the Lord of all people and he gives eternal life to all those who believe in him. Now the question is, what is the sole purpose of the gospel? Find this, the, the message is about Jesus Christ, about his humanity and divinity. How does that personally relate to us? What is the purpose of God giving us his son? God sending himself or God condescending himself as a man. What is the purpose of him dying and resurrecting and being declared as a son of God? What is the purpose? The purpose is, Paul says, we have received grace and apostleship to continue this proclamation of the gospel. Why? Here he says, to bring about the obedience of faith, which means everywhere gospel is preached, this work must happen. So the objective of the message of the Holy Bible, which is the gospel, which is about Jesus Christ, which is about his incarnation and his resurrection, everything in between, the objective of preaching this is not for information's sake, but for transformation. It must bring about in each one of us obedience of faith. In other words, it must bring about obedience that is produced by faith, which is the work of God. So dear brothers and sisters, this evening, ask yourself this question. Number one, is this where the foundation of your life is laid? Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, the Savior of your life? Do you believe that the Holy Bible's singular message is about Christ and God's redemptive work or God's forgiving work on behalf of sinners by providing a substitute for us in the person of Christ? Do you believe that? And do you know that the reason gospel is preached through, through whatever means God is using, using the Holy Bible as the source, do you understand that it is to produce obedience in us, obedience to believe in Christ as our Savior, to believe in Christ as our Lord? If that is not happening, then either you are not listening to the right gospel or you are rejecting the gospel that is true, that is being preached to you. Because that is why Paul says, we received grace and apostleship. To preach the gospel as a herald, as an apostle, set up my life apart, to preach the gospel as a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to preach this gospel of God regarding Jesus Christ, who is God, who became man, who died and rose back on the third day. That is why Holy Spirit declared with power that he is the son of God. I'm preaching this day in and day out so that those who hear through writing, through hearing, through reading, they may know that they know must bend their knee, repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ Jesus. They must obey. They must submit their lives to the Lordship of Christ and bring their entire life under this new king, new rule that is the Lord Jesus himself. That is the purpose of the gospel. And see, it, 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 it is for his name's sake. This, this gospel is preached for his name's sake. Yes, People are important. Yes, God is concerned about their eternity. But what is at stake more than you and me is the name and fame of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the chief reason why gospel must be preached. Yes, we must preach the gospel because people are perishing. Yes, there is no other hope. There's no other answer. There's no other solution. But remember, God's greater concern is for the glory of his own name. That is why sin is defined as falling short of the glory of God, not just breaking a law. Falling short of the glory of God. And that's why it says, for his name's sake, we preach the gospel so that people may come to obey this faith. In obedience of faith, they bend their knee and submit their lives to this king who became their savior by becoming their substitute on the cross. And what is the scope to whom this must be preached? Among all nations. This means 
it must cover all of humanity it doesn't mean that everybody will be saved without exception no it means without any distinction to every person this gospel is preached that is why the singular message of the holy bible is god saving you in and through the person and work of his son jesus christ that is the message if you don't get that message but if you are able to find god's will for this and that and you are able to find breakthroughs and promises and all of that you are mistaken you are mistaken this is the sole purpose of the gospel when it is preached the name of jesus is elevated people may see and say this god who is the king of kings died on my behalf or oh, now i repent of my sins and i cringe before him to graciously receive his forgiveness and this new life of becoming his child forever and ever and that is the scope and it must be preached to all people this evening i am being part of preaching that gospel and you are responsible in listening to the gospel and that is why in sixth verse he says including to you who are called to belong to jesus christ what what does this gospel do ultimately it 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 calls us from sin it calls us from world it calls us from being under the wrath of god it calls us from being under the slavery to sin and being under subjection to satan it calls us from being under the looming wrath of god now to the forgiveness to the eternal hope to the justifying sanctifying gracious work of god to in jesus christ it calls us to belong to jesus christ we always belong to him but when sin entered through adam we were separated from him instead of destroying us god laid the axe on his son now he is calling us to belong to him one more time this is the final call the eternal call of god roman 16 says this is the command of the eternal god there is no other good news there is no other greater news there is no other message and that is why there is no other greater foundation that god himself can give apart from the gospel you have a holy bible a copy of the holy bible you will read it this new year understand that the summary is the gospel itself because it is from god and it is only found in the holy bible and it is about jesus christ him becoming a man to rescue you and me forever and ever and the sole purpose is that you may obey him in all aspects of life one day he's coming back if your foundation is not on jesus christ and not in the salvation that jesus has given my brother and sister for all of eternity he'll be separated and you'll be doomed now as i said there are two kinds of people those who believe but have you though you have been a believer are you each day each day belonging to christ by coming under the authority of his word if you are not living in submission to the inspired word of god you are not living in submission to the incarnated word of god and maybe there are those who are never born again you heard the gospel jesus being god became man died in your place resurrected to prove that he is god now he sent this message to tell you that he is coming back if you repent of your sins and turn to him and place your faith in him to be your savior and submit to his loving gentle lordship he will redeem you transform your life this is the foundation on which you lay your life not just this new year may the lord help each one of us brothers and sisters to introspect to reflect on the word and live by this word shall we pray dear lord this is your gospel this is the greatest good news the only good news the one solution the one answer the one hope for all of life and eternity there is nothing else that you will give because you have given us your all in your son there are those maybe who do not know you tonight holy spirit we pray for your convicting work in their lives that they may turn to you. Those of us who know you or not, may we, like Paul, by the power of the gospel, be transformed through the work of the Holy Spirit to be the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heralds of the gospel, to set our lives apart 
to become the gospel. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ and to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ through our work, through our relationships, through our money, through our resources, through everything before you come back. Come Lord Jesus as we wait for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.